So, hi everyone, I'm Michelle. I'm the VP People at 5AI. If you've not heard of us, we're a UK tech company taking on one of the biggest challenges in engineering and research of our time, which is autonomous vehicles. So, we are hiring, shameless plug, but if anyone out there is looking to get involved in autonomous vehicles, please come and say hi afterwards. But the privilege is completely mine this morning. I've got Dan and Otto, um, two of the, the, the greatest team builders in Europe, in my opinion. They scale teams fast and they scale them safely. So, if you'd like to introduce yourselves. Sure. So, uh, yeah, I've been a programmer for around about 20 years, uh, been in doing all kinds of web stuff. I joined Twitter, um, I was around about the 100, 120 employees, so this is sort of uh, early on at the height of the fail whale, which is, which is fun, um, <laughs> and, and grew as a manager in that company, ran the web team there, um, and sort of saw that past IPO, and then went on to join Deliveroo as VP of Engineering, and like the intro said, um, that team grew enormously. It was an amazing ride. We, we went from 12 engineers to 230, I believe. Recently, though, um, I uh, left Deliveroo, and I'm spending some time uh, advising uh, companies and small startups on how to grow their engineering teams. Great so, yeah, stuff. That's me. Welcome, Otto. All right. Um, so my name is Otto Hilsko. I'm the chief product officer at Smartly.io, which is one of the fastest growing B2B SaaS startups in Europe. Uh, we are in the performance marketing space, working with uh, some of the biggest e-commerce companies uh, in the world. Uh, my background is I'm a developer. I started writing code when I was something like 12. Um, started my first company as soon as I was legally allowed to do that in Finland, which is at the age of 18. Um, and then my previous company, Flowdoc, uh, raised money from Silicon Valley. We sold it to Rally Software, uh, worked a lot with American companies in the history. Uh, but now back here, building the team at Smartly, uh, to which I had first invested in, and then I figured I need a more hands-on approach, um, and, and decided <laughs> and join to join them. the team. Nice. So I think between us, we've probably, well, we've worked in investor-backed companies. We've probably hired, uh, fired as well, maybe, but certainly nurtured thousands of uh, engineers and product teams. Yeah. So. To keep this simple, because I think we could talk about this all day, um, I just want to sort of start off with the hiring process um, and then move into the transition that teams go through when you're very, very small. And there's a lot of founders here that when you're just starting out, you've got those tiny teams, pizza-sized teams, and how you take that transition through to actually having a scale up with, like you have done, a couple of hundred people. And then finally, we'll wrap up with how you nurture those teams into high-performing engineering teams. I don't know how we're going to fit this all in. We've got 23 minutes left. So let's get this started. Um, before you put your ad out, before you get going, what advice would you give people before you've even sp picked up the phone and spoken to an engineer? What's, what's your kind of top tips for getting cracking? Um, I'd say it's really, really important to be prepared ahead of time, um, especially at the early startup stage. Uh, an interview can be quite a piecemeal experience. I, I could tell tales of really, uh, really funny interview experiences with startups. But um, it's the candidate experience in an interview is really, really important. One of the things that you have on your side um, as a small company that really does help you recruit great people is your reputation in the industry. You want everyone to, who um, speaks to you to have a great experience, for everything to be joined up, for you to give them decisions and feedback in a timely way, and really have a directed interview experience. So it's, it's pretty much the day one thing that I'll do when I join a team and know that it needs to grow. I, I look at what uh, process there is for hiring all, you know, all, of, the way, all of the way through from uh, sourcing to uh, first week in the job and uh, you know, revise that and make sure that everyone has a jo uh, their job that they need to do and the, and the candidate's experience is great. Cool. So everyone understands their part, the role that they're playing 
almost, it, it, it's all pre-organized, so the candidate is just given that white glove service all the way through? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you don't need to be polished to the point that you're not showing the character of your company, because that's also really important. But um, it's those important things like getting timely feedback, not having a candidate chase you right. for a yes or no answer or leaving them and to, um, for days and days. All of these kinds of things, like yeah. be, be very much ready with, uh, with all of that and, and be timely is, is, is the big thing, I think. Okay, Otto? Yeah, maybe my take would be that, first of all, when you're starting a company, you probably don't know what you're going to be doing as a company. You might not have a product market fit. Right. So you need a team that's going to be quite flexible. So you're going to want to hire generalists mm -hmm. without putting them to two specific boxes of roles and kind of what they're supposed to be doing. Um, also, developer hiring is extremely difficult. And most likely, if you're an early stage company, you are not going to be able to attract the best people right away because there's numerous things that developers are interested in, like working with the best people and, and working on great technologies and also, of course, on the purpose of the company. But in the beginning, you don't have much of that. Mm -hmm. So it is going to be the founder most certainly selling the vision and, and talking to, to those developers. Even if you might not be the expert in developer hiring, you just have to get out there because it's not going to be anyone else who's going to be able to do it uh, for you in the, in the early days. Mm -hmm. Also, you have to kind of take the approach of constantly trying to uh, improve and kind of raise the bar. So um, most likely, you don't want to appoint the first developer you meet as your CTO. You most likely want to kind of start hiring developers, constantly expand the team's expertise, uh, kind of improve the skill set, and then you'll start to see where, where the biggest demand is, where do you want those specialized roles, and so on. That, that flexibility and, and trying to detect that in your interview process is really important. Because, mm -hmm. yeah, like you say, it's, you don't really know what you're going to be concentrating on in, in the early days of a company. You need the people to follow you there. And, one question that I've, oh my God, I'm giving this away if I interview more people now. But one <laughs> question that I really rely on to, to, to get that kind of information is I'll always ask a candidate, what is the proudest uh, uh, achievement that uh, they've done in their career so far? And what I'm looking for there, again, I'm, I can't use this question again, can no. I? Oh, well. um, but what I'm looking for there is for people to be you know, genuinely interested in the impact that they're making for the business and not tell me about how they refactored something or, or got to use the latest technology. That, that's fun. But if, if, if that's the only thing that an engineer is going to be motivated by, then an early stage startup is probably not going to be the right place for them. Mm. So yeah, but it's a, it's a huge thing. And yeah. in those really early stages where you're, you're cons you have constraints, you've got both time and money constraints, how much time would you spend on actually hiring? And, and what advice would you give to founders and yeah. early stage tech leaders in terms of organizing their time yeah. to build their team? Yeah, I guess it's kind of a cliche that you should be spending half of your time on recruiting, but I literally checked my calendar and I had spent 30 hours a week uh, on hiring at yep. some stages when we were really growing fast. So, and especially in the early days since I was running most of the recruiting process myself, yep. including kind of uh, getting the prospects in and validating their skills and everything else. So that did take a lot of time. Of course, now we have a lot of people and the team helping on that. Um, but yeah, it's a time sink. It's, um the, I think you need to apply the same uh, thinking that you apply to other things about it. Like, yes, uh, if, you, if you walk into a team and you know that it has to expand massively, then that's where your priority as a leader of that team should be. However, I, I really would rather put all of my effort into you know, scaling that as an activity, just like I would uh, you know, put my effort into building tools and platforms that help us uh, scale further. And so, um, you know, it's all about getting those processes in place, finding the right people, um, uh, making sure all of, all of your staff have interview training and are capable of doing interviews. So you're not the one. Um, you know, like anything is when you when you're a leader, you you do not want to be the bottleneck. So uh, 
that kind of thing is really important up front. Another reason why um, I'd say this is a, a thing that I, a mistake that I've made now that I retrospectively have, uh, would never do again. Um, I think it's really important to, to hire your managers or, or, or nurture your managers from the team up front because at the end of the day, they're the people that you know, help you scale that sort of human side of the team. So that leads me on to my next question is at what point in the team's growth do you bring in a manager or do you home grow? A manager. Yeah, well, there's definitely different uh, approaches to this. Uh, at Smartly, we always talked about the flat organization and and everything that brings it with it, uh, even to a point where it started to be harmful because people got too attached to the kind of flat hierarchy and not the benefits of it, which is, of course, that people are able to make the decisions themselves. Uh, you get to talk direct and solve problems directly with anyone. So we actually went quite far without uh, any team leads or managers. Uh, I think I had 30 direct reports at the point where we established the team leads. So we went pretty far. But then again, that again kind of goes with the same principle of building the flexibility in, in the early days. And we actually had a team that was able to work on almost any area of the code base and any area of the product. And when you have a lot of these generalists from the early days, mm -hmm. and then you start scaling, uh, then you have the knowledge already within the teams. And then some, for, it's a lot easier for someone to come in as a, as a new team lead for that. So we, it took a, quite a long for us. But uh, I think now we can all agree that it, it was a necessary change. And, and, and we, we support this kind of a structure where someone uh, is there to help you and, and, uh, and hmm. to mentor you. I want to come back to that point in a minute. But before we move on, um, Dan just touched on onboarding and making sure that things were set up, right? So you've spent all of this time kind of getting people into the funnel, pulling them through an assessment process. You make the offer. They, they agree. Hmm. At what point? Do you, do you think onboarding for a small startup is really important to get right? And, and what's like minimum viable onboarding experience? I think minimum viable is the, is the key. Um, I think with, like with everything with startups, uh, you, it's not appropriate to bring the kitchen sink of processes. And I suppose that's another thing that you, you see quite a lot. Someone will arrive from a larger company and they'll go, OK, and now we will set up all of the scaffolding of a giant company. There is no need to do that. But at the same time, it, it, it is really important to, to get that, that initial experience right. Because I think the, you know, that, that very first initial ex experience, especially the first week and, and you know, going on past that, really sets the context under which you know, that person really understands how the, com the company works. Um, you know, and, and we all know it can be an ex a scary experience of dropping into a new company, especially one that's uh, moving relatively fast, and especially a small one where you, know, you can make these kind of earth-crushing mistakes because they don't have the checks and balances of a larger company. And so you know, really working out what that means for your company is uh, really important. And really watch that, get feedback. Um, uh, something that uh, we did at Deliveroo is we quite regularly um, have a, a sort of an onboarding retro uh, and get people in um, who've done the uh, done recently gone through the onboarding experience, listen to their feedback, make changes, and and and, and, and evolve the process as we go. That's cool, and it's not just swag on your desk and having a machine, well, a machine and a chair. It's it's about being a productive engineer for right from the get-go. And yeah. Otto, you have um, an incredible culture handbook on your website. <laughs> and could you talk us through onboarding uh, at Smartly? And how does, that, how does that go? Yeah, the onboarding at Smartly is getting more and more intense all the time since we, are kind of, we keep uh, adding stuff. Actually, the culture code is written by Siri, who's here, here, here in the front row, and she did a Great job it's instilling, uh, instilling kind of the taking what we had and putting it into great uh, quotes and kind of practical examples of what it actually means and, and kind of writing it down, which of course we did 
quite a bit later, um, not in the early days, then we had some, some black and white prints from the office printer about uh, kind of core values. But now uh, we have a culture handbook that we talk about and that we share publicly. Uh, people have often read that before they even apply. So, and that has been even a great uh, source of candidates for us. Uh, but really the whole onboarding is something that um, it's not about, as you said, getting your laptop or getting the keys to the office, but I would say the first two months, which is when you should start to become uh, more of a kind of productive uh, in your role. And for that, first of all, every role is a bit different, every team is a bit different, so you're going to need a customized approach. So we have a Smartly buddy who's helping you in all of the tasks and someone that you know that you can always ask from. That said, we always try to focus on the fact that you can ask from anyone, but people just don't, so it's, it makes it easier if you assign someone specifically for that. And then we just go through a lot of the different background of why we're approaching things like this. Uh, what's the history of the company? What, 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 what is the vision? What's behind it? Um, we talk about the culture and the values and so on. But then, of course, it's not about just bringing in to the culture, but then you kind of reinforce that by your actions and how you kind of live it uh, in the daily and weekly routines. There's um, one thing I never thought I'd be saying this, but um, <laughs> uh, at, at Delivery, we brought in um, Facebook for work. Is that what the product is called now? Workplace. Uh, the uh, private Facebook instance for, for the company. Um, and, and I personally thought it would be a terrible idea. It turned out, uh, especially for onboarding, to be a really useful tool because I found myself uh, directing everyone who joined the company to just like spend a day digging around this thing because something that is really important for uh, a new employee to, to really understand is the context, like where, where we, how we got where we, we are now and, and, and how that informs those decisions and, and also the style of communication and all of that kind of thing. And actually um, having uh, everyone browse all of the conversation about everything, which is all in the open as well, uh, um, you know, and, uh, which is a great thing, just allow people to sort of get up to speed and feel really comfortable being part of conversations and much more quickly. So uh, yeah, uh, it, that was an unexpected uh, lesson for me there. Um, I, and there, you know, there are lots of similar tools, but, but that was great. Other tools are available. We use Slack, pin everything. Slack, Slack is uh, harder to read through the history of, which That's was true. why we tend to use that for timely stuff, but mm -hmm. uh, uh, the longer form uh, conversation all went, went on, on Facebook, which is good. I think my final question is around nurturing that early team, those generalists that you hired that actually have a lot of the end-to-end -end architecture, and they know all the dark corners of your code base, possibly better than you may. Um, how do you keep them when you're constantly onboarding new engineers every single week? What, what kind of people processes would you suggest that early stage founders set up? And when should they be thinking about that to retain those early hires all the way through to 300? Do you, well, it depends. Do you want to? Uh, I mean, if you've, got a, if you've got a gnarly gatekeeper of some code, I mean, I think that when you identify that situation, uh, those people are either going to, um, you know, you put them, them in a position where they, they eliminate their own bus factor and, and either they thrive and are, are great at onboarding people um, and writing documentation and, and getting people up to speed, or they don't. And I think if they don't, you need to solve that problem really quickly because those things, if left alone, can get very ugly. Mm -hmm. And you do not want to be in a position where you're having to you know, offer this, the, you know, the, the, the gnarly gatekeeper of the dark corner of the code an enormous amounts of money you know, pre some giant funding round later on down the line. It's really worth, yeah, like, don't have that situation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would say <clears throat> for retaining developers, uh, of course, the key is that your work 
should have a purpose. You should uh, understand that what you're building affects the outcome of the company, and you should see that actual people are using what you're building. Uh, so we bring developers very close to customers. We invite all of our biggest customers to visit us in Helsinki. So every couple of weeks or every week, we have someone who's spending two days workshops meeting each of the development teams. And with that kind of things, when you actually see that what you just built, it actually has an impact, and someone's actually, someone's work just got a lot better because of what you did. Uh, in our case of a B2B software, uh, I think that, that's one of the key drivers. Then, of course, there's things that make you lose developers, which is if you do stupid things, like you limit people's ability to solve problems by putting them to specific roles uh, that don't allow them to make some decisions and so on, or kind of have lots of control on who gets to make those decisions. So one of our core principles has been always to empower the teams to make all of the decisions. Uh, the teams maintain their own roadmaps, they have a higher level goal, and based on that they build their roadmaps and kind of decide how to balance that work. So <clears throat> by giving that flexibility, the teams have the freedom to improve um, uh, their work all the time. Then of course, still keeping the hiring bar high because uh, at some point if you realize that uh, I'm working with people that I don't want to work with, um, you're going to be out pretty soon. Yeah, absolutely. And I think a lot of people, you know, when, when you talk about keeping the hiring bar high, um, you know, you, you would imagine you get better and better and more technical people. But in a, in a way, I would value um, raising the hiring bar in terms of people skills um, is, is more, you know, more highly, really, because as the as the team gets bigger, the the more their job, uh, everyone's job is going to involve working with people, um, and it, and it and I think it takes a, sometimes it can take a different kind of person to thrive in a you know a ten person team than it can in a hundred person team, and you know like that that's fine, but it's worth it's worth sort of watching out for and understanding that. Quick question, because I'm just conscious of time. At what point do you introduce career paths and career ladders for your engineers? Is that, with the flat hierarchy up to 30, and then through the next phase of growth, at what point did you introduce that kind of formal structure? I think it's really worth having an idea of what that might be at the start. And the reason I think that's important is not because you want to go and tell everyone in your 10-person team exactly kind of what their title is, but because I, I suppose my, my personal philosophy with, with compensation is I like to think at any point in the company, um, you know, if I threw everyone's salaries and, and, and benefits up on a, on a board for everyone to see, can I explain to everyone, you know, exactly why they fit where, where they fit? So, I think from, from that point of view, it's really good to understand where you're going, um, both so you can you know, have, have some plan going forward for compensation as the, as the team grows, and also so you can let people know that there is opportunities for them and they don't have to jump into a different company to, to uh, continue progression. They don't have to jump into management to continue prog progression. Like, uh, so uh, yeah, th there's a few things there, but again, it's, it's one of those things where I don't bring the kitchen sink and you know, have a 72 point uh, hierarchy of everyone in the company and all that kind of thing. Okay, yeah. so. Yeah, yeah I, I, I would kind of go back to the original approach of keeping it really flexible and simple in the early days, as long as you can. Um, we don't have any titles with developers. Everyone's a software engineer, mm -hmm. that's it. Um, for making salaries transparent, we do have a leveling system nowadays that we just introduced okay. uh, this year, so that's a relatively new thing. But I think instead of thinking of development as this one-dimensional uh, thing, I would rather see people focusing on what can I do to develop my learning and what are all the dimensions where I can work on that. And I can take ownership of big projects, like I could be leading the project that ends up building half of the company's revenue. Uh, that would be a great accomplishment. Uh, I'm sure that would be rewarded. Um, 
there's other ways of how can I improve the engineering team's ways of working, um, how can I help in recruiting. There's so many of these dimensions where you can help and be proactive. And uh, I think focusing on this seniority uh, label is, is counterproductive to that. Yeah, absolutely. I think it, it's all about impact on the, on, the, on the success of the company in whichever way is. And, and, uh, different engineers I've seen impact the company in really different ways. Some some engineers have a huge impact because they're the life of the team and they and and they're the the person that everyone goes to to uh, you know answer questions. Or some people are huge uh, have a huge influence on hiring and all kinds of things. There's there's lots of different ways, but it's like it's impact that should be rewarded. It's the best piece of advice you've been given in your own careers. Um, so uh, a long time ago when I was at uh, Twitter and when it was quite small, Dick Costolo, who was uh, CEO at the time, used to run uh, management courses for all of the new managers personally. Um, and this isn't strictly about recruiting, but one thing that he said to me, which has stuck with me all the time, is whenever you're having a, a difficult conversation with someone, you need to optimize for clarity, not for them leaving the room feeling better. And I, I, I think that, that piece of advice sort of has, has um, influenced me massively. That's awesome. And then my final question to you, Otto, is if you could go back 10 years, what would you say to, to yourself back then? Yeah, so I, I was actually in the audience of Slush uh, 10 years ago in the first, first event. Um, <clears throat> so I would say one thing I've really learned about running companies, not necessarily just about building engineering teams, is it's all about the speed of execution. And mostly startups just run out of time. And if you spend all this time kind of trying to come up with processes for whatever compensation, what, all kinds of other things, uh, you are going to be spending that time while your focus should be on your customers. And there's many ways you can execute faster. You can learn from others. You can get great mentors uh, and so on. And, and, and that can be a great shortcut uh, that, that uh, helps you move, move a lot faster. And because otherwise, the company will eventually just run out of money when you don't reach in, uh, to, uh, all the iterations that you would have needed. That's great. So to wrap up, I've got a long shopping list here, but code your culture early. Um, make sure that you do have a hiring process. It won't slow you down. It's actually, there's a reason why we have a hiring process. Onboard really well to get engineers productive as quickly as possible. Keep the bar really high throughout the years of building the team and keep empowering them and, make, and taking care of their careers. Thanks, everyone. I think Thanks. that's a wrap. Thank you. Thank you.